Exercise 1. Hi, George. Glad you're back. Loads of people have phoned you. Really? I felt just like your secretary. Sorry. I went into the library this afternoon to have a look at a newspaper and I came across something really interesting. What? A book? No, a brochure from a summer festival, mainly Spanish music. Look, I've got it here. Spanish music? I really love the guitar. Let's have a look. So what's this group, uh, Guitarini? They're really good. They had a video with all the highlights of the festival at a stand in the lobby to the library, so I heard them. They play fantastic instruments, drums and flutes and old kinds of guitars. I've never heard anything like it before. Sounds great. OK, shall we go then? Spoil ourselves? Yes, let's. The only problem is there aren't any cheap seats. It's all one price. Huh. Well, in that case, we could sit right at the front. We'd have a really good view. Yeah, though I think that if you sit at the back, you can actually hear the whole thing better. Mm, yes. Anyway, we can decide when we get there. So will you fill in the form, or shall I? I'll do it. Name, George O'Neill. Address, 48 North Avenue, West Sea. Do you remember our new postcode? Still can't remember it. Mm, just a minute. I've got it written down here. Ah, WS62YH. Do you need the phone, too? Please. I'm really bad at numbers. 01674-553-242. So let's book two tickets for Guitarini. OK. If you're sure, 750 each is all right. How do you feel about the singer? Mm, I haven't quite decided. But I've noticed something on the booking form that might just persuade me. What's that, then? Free refreshments. Really? Yes, look here. Sunday, 17th of June. Singer. Ticket, six pounds, includes drinks in the garden. Sounds like a bargain to me. <laughs> yes. Let's book two tickets for that. So, what else? I'm feeling quite keen now. How about the pianist on the 22nd of June? Anna Ventura? I've just remembered that's my evening class night. Mm, that's OK. I'll just have to go on my own. But we can go to the Spanish dance and guitar concert together, can't we? Yes, I'm sure Tom and Kieran would enjoy that too. Good heavens, £10.50 a ticket. I can see we're going to have to go without food for the rest of the week. <laughs> we'll need to book four. Oh, wish we were students. Look, children, students and senior citizens get a 50% discount on everything. If only. Exercise 2 Hello, and thank you for asking me to your teacher's meeting to talk about the Dinosaur Museum and to tell you a bit about what you can do with your students there. Well, let me give you some of the basic information first. In regard to opening hours... We're open every day of the week from 9am to 8pm, except on Mondays, when we close at 1.30pm. And in fact, the only day in the year when we're closed is on the 25th of December. You can book a guided tour for your school group any time that we're open. If you bring a school group to the museum, when you arrive, we ask you to remain with your group in the car park. One or more of the tour guides will welcome you there and brief you about what the tour will be about. We do this there because our entrance is quite small and we really haven't got much room for briefing groups in the exhibition area. As far as the amount of time you'll need goes, if you bring a school group, you should plan on allowing a minimum of 90 minutes for the visit. This allows 15 minutes to get on and off the coach 45 minutes for the guided tour and 30 minutes for after-tour activities. If you're going to have lunch at the museum, you will of course have to allow more time. There are two cafes in the museum with seating for 80 people. If you want to eat there, you'll need to reserve some seating as they can get quite crowded at lunchtime. Then, outside the museum at the back, there are tables 
and students can bring their own lunch and eat it there in the open air. When the students come into the museum foyer, we ask them to check in their backpacks with their books, lunch boxes, etc., at the cloakroom before they enter the museum proper. I'm afraid in the past we have had a few things gone missing after school visits, so this is a strict rule. Also, some of the exhibits are fragile, and we don't want them to be accidentally knocked. But we do provide school students with handouts with questions and quizzes on them. There's so much that students can learn in the museum, and it's fun for them to have something to do. Of course, they'll need to bring something to write with for these. We do allow students to take photographs. For students who are doing projects, it's useful to make some kind of visual record of what they see that they can add to their reports. And finally, they should not bring anything to eat into the museum or drinks of any kind. There are also a few things that students can do after the tour. In the theatreette on the ground floor, there are continuous screenings of short documentaries about dinosaurs, which they can see at any time. We used to have an activity room with more interactive things like making models of dinosaurs and drawing and painting pictures, even hunting for dinosaur eggs. But unfortunately, the room was damaged in a bad storm recently when water came in the roof, so that's closed at the moment. But we do have an IT centre where students have access to CD-ROMs with a range of dinosaur games. These games are a lot of fun. But they also teach the students about the lives of dinosaurs, how they found food, protected their habitat, survived threats, that kind of thing. And、um, I think that's all I have to tell you. Please feel free to ask any questions if you would like to know anything else. About Exercise three. Right, Sandra. You wanted to see me to get some feedback on your group's proposal. The one you're submitting for the Geography Society field trip competition. Uh huh. I've had a look through your proposal, and I think it's a really good choice.、Oh. <laughs> in fact, I only have a few things to say about it. But even in an outline document like this, you really have to be careful to avoid typos and problems with layout in the proposal, and even in the contents page. So read it through carefully before submitting it. Okay? Will do. And I've made a few notes on the proposal about things which could have been better sequenced. Okay. As for the writing itself, I've annotated the proposal as and where I thought it could be improved. Generally speaking, I feel you've often used complex structures and long sentences for the sake of it, and as a consequence, although your paragraphing and inclusion of subheadings help, it's quite hard to follow your train of thought at times.、Oh. So, cut them down a bit, can you? Really? Yes, and don't forget simple formatting like numbering. Didn't I use page numbers? I didn't mean that. Look, you've remembered to include headers and footers, which is good, but listing ideas clearly is important. Number them or use bullet points, which is even clearer. Then you'll focus the reader on your main points. I thought your suggestion to go to the Navajo Tribal Park was a very good idea. No,、oh, I've always wanted to go there. My father was a great fan of cowboy films and the Wild West, so I was subjected to seeing all the epics, <laughs> many of which were shot there.、Mm -hmm. As a consequence, it feels very familiar to me, and it's awesome both geographically and visually. So it's somewhere I've always wanted to visit. The subsequent research I did and the online photographs made me even keener. Interesting. Right. Let's look at the content of your proposal now. Did you find it comprehensive enough? Well, yes and no. You've listed several different topics on your contents page, but I'm not sure they're all relevant. No. Well. I thought that from the perspective of a field trip, one thing I needed to focus on was the sandstone plateau and cliffs themselves. The way they tower up from the flat landscape is just amazing. The fact that the surrounding softer rocks were eroded by wind and rain, leaving these huge outcrops high above the plain. 
It's hardly surprising that tourists flock to see the area. Well, yes, I'd agree with including those points. And then the fact that it's been home to Native American Navajos and all the social history that goes with that. The hardships they endured trying to save their territory from the invading settlers. Their culture is so rich. All those wonderful stories. Well, I agree it's interesting, but it's not immediately relevant to your proposal, Sandra. So at this stage, I suggest you focus on other considerations. I think an indication of what the students on the trip could actually do when they get there should be far more central, so that certainly needs to be included and to be expanded upon. And I'd like to see something about the local wildlife and vegetation, too. Not that I imagine there's much to see. Presumably the tourist invasion hasn't helped. Okay, <clears throat> I'll do some work on those two areas as well. But you're right, there's not much apart from some very shallow-rooted species. Although it's cold and snowy there in the winter, the earth is baked so hard in the summer sun that rainwater can't penetrate. Mm -hmm. So it's a case of flood or drought, really. So I understand. Now, before we look at everything in more detail, I've got a few factual questions for you. It would be a good idea to include the answers in your finished proposal, because they're missing from your draft. Fine. So, you mentioned the monoliths and the spires, which was good. But what area does the tribal park cover? Do you know? 12,000 hectares. And the plain is at about 5,850 meters above sea level. Mm, larger than I expected. Okay. Where's the nearest accommodation? That's a practical detail that you haven't included. Have you done any research on that? Yes. There's nowhere to stay in the park itself, but there's an old trading post called Goulding quite near. All kinds of tours start from Goulding, too. What kind of tours? Well, the most popular are in four-wheel drive jeeps, but I wouldn't recommend hiring those. I think the best way to appreciate the area would be to hire horses instead and trek around on those. Biking is not allowed, and it's impossible to drive around the area in private vehicles. The tracks are too rough. Okay. Lastly, what else is worth visiting there? There are several caves, but I haven't looked into any details. I'll find out about them. Okay, good. Now what I'd like to know is... Exercise 4 so, welcome to your introductory geography lecture. We'll begin with some basics. Firstly, what do we learn by studying geography? Well, we learn a great deal about all the processes that have affected and that continue to affect the Earth's surface. But we learn far more than that, because studying geography also informs us about the different kinds of relationships that develop between a particular environment and the people that live there. OK, we like to think of geography as having two main branches. There's the study of the nature of our planet, its physical features, what it actually looks like, and then there's the study of the ways in which we choose to live and of the impact of those on our planet. Our current use of carbon fuels is a good example of that. But there are more specific study areas to consider too, and we'll be looking at each of these in turn throughout the semester. These include biophysical geography, by which I mean the study of the natural environment and all its living things. Then there's topography. That looks at the shapes of the land and oceans. There's the study of political geography and social geography too, of course, which is the study of communities of people. We have economic geography, in which we examine all kinds of resources and their use, agriculture, for example. Next comes historical geography, the understanding of how people and their environments and the ways they interact have changed over a period of time. And urban geography, an aspect I'm particularly interested in, which takes as its focus the location of cities, the services that those cities provide, and migration of people to and from such cities. And lastly, 
we have cartography. That's the art and science of map making. You'll be doing a lot of that. So, to summarise before we continue, we now have our key answer. Studying this subject is important because without geographical knowledge, we would know very little about our surroundings and we wouldn't be able to identify all the problems that relate to them. So, by definition, we wouldn't be in an informed position to work out how to solve any of them. OK, now for some practicalities. What do geographers actually do? Well, we collect data to begin with. You'll be doing a lot of that on your first field trip. How do we do this? There are several means. We might, for example, conduct a census, count a population in a given area, perhaps. We also need images of the Earth's surface, which we can produce by means of computer generation technology or with the help of satellite relays. We've come a very long way from the early exploration of the world by sailing ships when geographers only had pens and paper at their disposal. After we've gathered our information, we must analyse it. We need to look for patterns, most commonly those of causes and consequences. This kind of information helps us to predict and resolve problems that could affect the world we live in. But we don't keep all this information confidential. We then need to publish our findings so that other people can access it and be informed by it. And one way in which this information can be published is in the form of maps. You'll all have used one at some stage of your life already. Let's consider the benefits of maps from a geographer's perspective. Maps can be folded and put in a pocket and can provide a great store of reference when they're collected into an atlas. They can depict the physical features of the entire planet if necessary or just a small part of it in much greater detail. But there is a drawback. You can't exactly replicate something that is three-dimensional, like our planet, on a flat piece of paper because paper has only two dimensions. And that means there'll always be a certain degree of distortion on a map. It can't be avoided. We can also use aerial photographs, pictures taken by cameras at high altitude above the Earth. These are great for showing all kinds of geographical features that are not easy to see from the ground. You can easily illustrate areas of diseased trees or how much traffic is on the roads at a given time or information about deep seabeds, for example. Then there are Landsats. These are satellites that circle the Earth and transmit visual information to computers at receiving stations. They circle the Earth several times a day and can provide a mass of information. You'll all be familiar with the information they give us about the weather, for example. So, what we're going to do now is look at a short presentation in which you'll see all these tools... Exercise 5 Good morning, Total Insurance. Judy speaking. How may I help you? I recently shipped my belongings from overseas back here to Australia and I took out insurance with your company. Some items were damaged during the move, so I need to make a claim. What do I have to do? OK, well, first I need to get a few details about this. Can you give me your name, please? Yes, it's Michael Alexander. OK, and your address, please? My old address or my current one? Your current one. It's 24 Manly Street, Milpera, near Sydney. What was the suburb, sorry? Milpera, M-I-L-P-E-R-R-A. Right. Now, who was the shipping agent, Mr Alexander? Mm, you mean the company we used? Yes, the company who packed everything up at the point of origin. Oh, it was, um, uh, first class movers. OK. Uh, where were the goods shipped from? China, but the ship came via Singapore and was there for about a week. Don't worry, all of that information will be in the documentation. Now, the dates. Do you know when the ship arrived? It left on the 11th of October and got to Sydney on the 28th of November. OK. I need one more thing. There's a reference number. It should be in the top right-hand corner of the pink form they gave you. Uh, let me have a look. Oh, I have so many papers. 
Ah, yes, here it is. It's 601-A-C-K. Thanks. I need to take down a few details of the actual damage over the phone before you put in a full report. Can you tell me how many items were damaged and what the damage was? Yes, well, four things, actually. I'll start with the big things. My TV, first of all. It's a large one, very expensive. Our insurance doesn't cover electrical problems. It isn't an electrical problem. The screen has a huge crack in it, so it's unusable. I see. Any idea of the price to repair it? No. Well, I don't think it can be repaired. It will need a new one. OK. I'll make a note of that and we'll see what we can do. Now, what was the second item? The cabinet from the bathroom was damaged as well. It's a lovely cabinet. We use it to keep our towels in. And what is the extent of the damage? Well, the back and the sides seem OK, but the door has a huge hole in it. It can't be repaired. I'm really not very happy about it. And how much do you think it will cost to replace it? Well, when I bought it last year, I paid $125 for it. But the one I've seen here in Sydney is a bit more expensive. It's $140. Right. And what was the third item? My dining room table. It's a lovely table from Indonesia. It must have been very hot inside the container because one leg has completely split down the middle. The top and the other three look OK, thank goodness. Any idea of the price to repair it? Well, I had an estimate done on this, actually, because it is a very special table to us. They quoted us $200, which is really pricey, so I hope the insurance will cover the total cost. I'm sure that will be fine. Uh, what was the last item, Mr Alexander? Well, we have a lovely set of china plates and dishes, you know, with matching cups, saucers, the lot. They were all in the one box, which must have got dropped because some plates were broken. Six, actually. And can you tell me the replacement value of these? Well, it's hard to say because they were part of a set, but they can be up to $10 each as it's such a good set. OK, so that would be around $60 altogether. Yes, that's right. And is that all of the items? Yes. So what do I have to do now? Exercise 6. Welcome to Greenvale Agricultural Park. As you know, we've only been open a week, so you're amongst our first visitors. We have lots of fascinating indoor and outdoor exhibits on our huge complex, spreading hundreds of hectares. Our remit is to give educational opportunities to the wider public, as well as to offer research sites for a wide variety of agriculturists and other scientists. Let's start by seeing what there is to do. As you can see uh, here on our giant wall plan, we are now situated in the reception block here. As you walk out of the main door into the park, there's a path you can follow. If you follow this route, you'll immediately come into the rare breeds section, where we keep a wide variety of animals, which I shall be telling you a little more about later. Next to this, uh, moving east, is the large grazing area for the rare breeds. Uh, then further east, in the largest section of our park, is the forest area. Um, south of the grazing area, and in fact just next to the reception block, is our experimental crop area. In the middle of the park, uh, this circular area, is our lake. Uh, these two small rectangular shapes here are the fish farms where we rear fish for sale. To the east of those is the marsh area, which attracts a great many migrant birds. Uh, in the southeastern corner, beyond the marsh, is our market garden area, growing vegetables and flowers. All these areas can be visited by the general public for almost all the year. Although, uh, please take note of the large signs at the entrance to each area, which tell which tell you when certain areas are being used for particular controlled experiments and are therefore temporarily out of bounds to the public. You can see for yourself what a huge area the park covers and a key question is always, how can we move around? Well, you have a choice of means. All environmentally friendly, um, cars are banned in the park, we have bicycles, which you can hire behind the reception block here. Uh, the healthy ones of you can go on foot. 
And finally, there's our electric tram powered from solar cells. You find more information about this at the front entrance. A good place to start on your tour is the rare breed section. We keep goats, sheep, and hens, and other kinds of poultry. We're also thinking of bringing in cows and horses, but we do not, as yet, have facilities for these bigger animals. The animals are fed in public twice a day, and a short lecture given on their feeding habits and nutritional needs. These are very popular with the public, but、uh, of course we mustn't lose sight of the main purpose of having this section. Not as such to preserve rare animals, but to maintain the diversity of breeds, to to broaden the gene pool for agricultural development. Greenvale changes with the seasons, with different events happening at different times of the year. May will be perhaps our most spectacular month, with the arrival of the Canada geese, and when our fruit trees will be in full blossom. But there are interesting events on all year round. Um, for example, John Havers, our expert fly fisherman, is currently giving displays on the lake. Each of the sections has its own seasonal calendar, and please consult the summary board at the main entrance. And the final section, as we return to the reception blocks, is the orchard. Do take time to browse round our shop. There's a wide selection of books on wildlife, some of them written by local authors, and the history of farming, including organic farming. Something which the park will be diversifying into in the coming months. Exercise seven. Good morning, everyone.、Uh, in today's seminar, Grant Freeman, a biologist who specialises in identifying insects and who works for the Australian Quarantine Service, has come to talk to us about his current research work. Right. Well,、uh, over to you, Grant. Good morning, everyone. I'm sure that you know that the quarantine service regulates all food brought into Australia. Well, obviously they want to protect Australia from diseases that might come in with imported goods, but they also want to prevent insect pests from being introduced into the country, and that's where I have a part to play. Anyway, my current research involves trying to find a particular type of bee, the Asian honey bee. And finding out whether there are any of them around in various states of Australia, we discovered a few of them in Queensland once and eradicated them. Now we're pretty keen to make sure that there aren't any more getting in, particularly to New South Wales and other states. What's wrong with Asian honeybees? Are they so different from Australian bees? Well, in fact, they look almost the same. But they are infested with mites, microscopic creatures which live on them, and which can seriously damage our own homegrown bees, or could even wipe them out. Well, what would happen if Australian bees died out? Well, the honey from Australian bees is of excellent quality, much better than the stuff the Asian bees produce. In fact, Australia exports native queen bees to a large number of countries because of this. When the European honey bee was first discovered out in the bush, we found they made really unpleasant honey, and they were also too big to pollinate many of our native flowers here in Australia. That must have had a devastating effect on the natural flora. Did you lose any species? No, we managed to get them under control before that happened. But if Asian bees got in, there could be other consequences. We could lose a lot of money because you might not be aware. But it's estimated that native bees' pollination of flower and vegetable crops is worth 1.2 billion dollars a year. So, in a way, they're the farmer's friend. Oh, and another thing is, if you're stung by an Asian honey bee, it can produce an allergic reaction in some people. So, they're much more dangerous than native bees. How will you know if Asian bees have entered Australia? We're looking at the diet of the bird called the rainbow bee eater. The bee eater doesn't care what it eats as long as they're insects. But the interesting thing about this bird is that we are able to analyse exactly what it eats, and that's really helpful if we're looking for introduced insects. How come? Because insects have their skeletons outside their bodies, so the bee eaters digest the meat from the inside. Then they bring up all the indigestible bits of skeleton, and of course the wings, in a pellet. A small ball of waste material, which they cough up. That sounds a bit unpleasant. So, how do you go about it? 
In the field, we track down the bee eaters and find their favourite feeding spots. You know, the places where the birds usually feed. It's here that we can find the pellets. We collect them up and take them back to the laboratory to examine the contents. How do you do that? The pellets are really hard, especially if they have been out in the sun for a few days. So, first of all, we treat them by adding water to moisten them and make them softer. Then we pull them apart under the microscope. Everything's all scrunched up, but we're looking for wings, so we just pull them all out and straighten them. Then we identify them to see if we can find any Asian bee wings. And how many have you found? So far, our research shows that Asian bees have not entered Australia in any number. It's a good result and much more reliable than trying to find live ones as evidence of introduced insects. Well, that's fascinating. Thank you, Grant, for those insights. I hope that you might inspire some of our students here to conduct some similar experiments. Exercise eight. I've been doing some research into what people in Britain think of doctors, the ones who work in general practice, the first call for medical care, and comparing this with the situation in a couple of other countries. I want to talk about the rationale behind what I decided to do. Now I had to set up my program of research in three different countries, so I approached postgraduates in my field in overseas departments. Contacting them by email to organize things for me at their end, I thought I would have trouble recruiting help, but in fact everyone was very willing, and sometimes their tutors got involved too. I had to give my helpers clear instructions about what kind of sample population I wanted them to use. I decided that people under eighteen should be excluded, because most of them are students or looking for their first job. And also, I decided at this stage just to focus on men who were in employment, and set up something for people who didn't have jobs and for employed women later on as a separate investigation. I specifically wanted to do a questionnaire and interviews with a focus group. With the questionnaire, rather than limiting it to one specific point, I wanted to include as much variety as possible. I know questionnaires are a very controlled way to do things, but I thought I could do taped interviews later on to counteract the effects of this. And the focus group may also prove useful in future by targeting subjects I can easily return to, as the participants tend to be more involved. So I'm just collating the results now. At the moment, it looks as if in the UK, despite the fact that newspapers continually report that people are unhappy with medical care, in fact, it is mainly the third level of care, which takes place in hospitals, that they are worried about. Government reforms have been proposed at all levels, and although their success is not guaranteed. Long-term hospital care is, in fact, probably less of an issue than the media would have us believe. However, I've still got quite a bit of data to look at. Certainly, I will need to do more far-reaching research than I had anticipated in order to establish if people want extra medical staff invested in the community, or if they want care to revert to fewer but larger key medical units. The solution may well be something that can be easily implemented by those responsible in local government, with central government support, of course. This first stage has proved very valuable, though. I was surprised by how willing most of the subjects were to get involved in the project. I had expected some unwillingness to answer questions honestly. But I was taken aback and rather concerned that something I thought I'd set up very well didn't necessarily seem that way to everyone in my own department. I thought you might also be interested in some of the problems I encountered in collecting my data. There were odd cases that threw me. One of the subjects who I had approached while he was out shopping in town decided to pull out when it came to the second round. It was a shame, as it was someone who I would like to have interviewed more closely. 
And one of the first-year students I interviewed wanted reassurance that no names would be traceable from the answers. I was so surprised, because they think nothing of telling you about themselves and their opinions in seminar groups. Then one of the people that I worked with got a bit funny. The questions were quite personal, and one minute he said he'd do it, then the next day he wouldn't. And in the end, he did do it. It's hard not to get angry in that situation, but I tried to keep focused on the overall picture in order to stay calm. The most bizarre case was a telephone interview I did with a teacher at a university in France. He answered all my questions in great detail, but then when I asked how much access he had to dangerous substances, he wouldn't tell me exactly what his work involved. Exercise 9 Good morning. How can I help you? Hello. I'm interested in renting a house somewhere in the town. Right. Uh, could I have your name, please? Yes, it's Stephen Godfrey. Mm -hmm. And tell me how many bedrooms you're looking for. Well, we'd need four because I'm going to share the house with three friends. Okay. There are several of that size on our books. They mostly belong to families who are working abroad at the moment. What about the location? It'd be nice to be central. Oh, that might be difficult, as most houses of that size are in the suburbs. Still, there are a few. What's your upper limit for the rent? We'd like something around £500 a month, but we could go up to £600 if we have to. But we can't go beyond that. Mm -hmm. Do you know how long you want to rent the house for? The minimum let is six months, as you probably realise. We're at college here for two years, and we don't want to have to move during that time if we can avoid it. Right. And how soon do you want to move in? All our lets start on the first of the month. Well, as soon as possible, really. So that means September 1st. OK. Let me have a look at what we've got. Uh, we have photographs of all the houses on our book, so you can get an idea of what they're like. There's this one in Oakington Avenue at £550 a month, combined living room and dining room with a separate kitchen. It doesn't have a garage, though you can park in the road. Ah, uh, we'd prefer to have one if possible. Right. Then have a look at this house in Mead Street. Mm -hmm. It's got a very large living room and kitchen, bathroom, cloakroom. How much is it? That one's 580 It's very well furnished and equipped. It also has plenty of space for parking, and it's available for a minimum of a year. Oh, and there's a big garden. I don't think we could cope with that, to be honest. We'll be too busy to look after it. Mm, OK. Uh, then there's this older house in Hamilton Road. Living room, kitchen, diner, and it has a study. Uh, 550 a month. That looks rather nice. But whereabouts in Hamilton Road? Towards the western end. Oh, that'll be very noisy. I know the area. Yes, it's pretty lively. But some people like it, though. Well, what about this house in Devon Close? That looks lovely. There's a big demand for houses in that area, so prices tend to be quite high. But this one hasn't been decorated for a few years, which has kept the rent down a bit. It's got a living room, dining room and small kitchen, and it's 595 a month. I think it would suit you from what you've said. Mm, it sounds fine. Why is that part of town so popular? Well, there's a big scheme to improve the district, and it'll soon have the best facilities for miles around. What sort of thing? There's a big sports centre under construction, which will be very impressive when it's finished. In fact, the swimming pool's already opened, ahead of schedule, and it's attracting a lot of people. What about cinemas? Are there any in the area? The only one closed down last year, and it's now in the process of being converted into a film museum. The local people are trying to get a new cinema added to the scheme. I think I heard something about a plan to replace the existing concert hall with a larger one. Ah, that's due to start next year. Ah. Well, it sounds an interesting area to live in. Mm. Could I go and see the house, please? Yes, of course. Exercise 10 Hello. And welcome to Focus on the Arts. I'm your host, Dave Green, and this is your very own local radio programme. 
Every Friday evening, we put the spotlight on different arts and culture facilities and look at the shows and events that are on offer in the coming week. And today, the focus is on the National Arts Centre. Now, if you don't already know it yourself, I'm sure you've all heard of it. It's famous throughout the world as one of the major venues for classical music. But did you know that it's actually much more than just a place to hear concerts? The centre itself is a huge complex that caters for a great range of arts. Under a single roof, it houses concert rooms, theatres, cinemas, art galleries, and a wonderful public library, as well as service facilities, including three restaurants and a bookshop. So, at any one time, the choice of entertainment there is simply enormous. So, how did they manage to build such a big arts complex right in the heart of the city? Well, the area was completely destroyed by bombs during the war in 1940. So the opportunity was taken to create a cultural centre that would be what they called the city's gift to the nation. Of course, it took a while for such a big project to get started, but it was planned in the 60s, built in the 70s, and eventually opened to the public in 1983. Ever since then, it has proved to be a great success. It's not privately owned, like many art centres, but is still in public hands. It's run by the City Council. Both our National Symphony Orchestra and National Theatre Company were involved in the planning of the project, and they're now based there, giving regular performances every week. And as the centre is open 363 days of the year, there are plenty of performances to choose from. So, to give you some idea of what's on, and to help you choose from the many possibilities, we've made a selection of the star attractions. If you're interested in classical music, then we recommend you go along to the National on either Monday or Tuesday evening at 7.30 for a spectacular production of The Magic Flute, probably the most popular of all Mozart's operas. It's in the Garden Hall, and tickets start at only £8, but you'll have to be early if you want to get them that cheap. And remember, it's only on for those two evenings. For those more interested in the cinema, you might like to see the new Canadian film, which is showing on Wednesday evening at 8pm in Cinema 2, and that's called Three Lives. It's had fantastic reviews, and tickets cost just £4.50, which is a reduction on the usual price of £5.50. So, it's really good value, especially for such a great movie. But you can see the centre's main attraction at the weekend, because on Saturday and Sunday, 11am to 10pm, they're showing a wonderful new exhibition that hasn't been seen anywhere else in Europe yet. It's a collection of Chinese art called Faces of China, that's in Gallery 1, and it has some really fascinating paintings and sculptures by leading artists from all over China. And the good news is that it's completely free, so don't miss it. So why not go along to the National Arts Centre next week for one or all of these great events? And you can always pick up a programme and check out all the other performances and exhibitions on offer, or coming soon, on almost every day of the year. Next week, we'll be looking at the new Museum of Science. Exercise 11 I've been reading your personal statement, Paul. First, let's talk about your work experience in South America. What took you there? Was it to gain more fluency in Spanish? Well, as I'm combining Spanish with Latin American studies, my main idea was to find out more about the way people lived there. My spoken Spanish was already pretty good, in fact. Mm, so you weren't too worried about language barriers? No. In fact, I ended up teaching English there, although that wasn't my original choice of work. I see. How did you find out about all this? I found an agency that runs all kinds of voluntary projects in South America. What kind of work? Well, there were several possibilities. You mean construction, engineering work? Yes. Getting involved in building projects was an option. Then there was tourism taking tourists for walks around the volcanoes, which I actually chose to do, and then there was work with local farmers. Mm. But you didn't continue with that project. Why not? Because I never really knew whether I'd be needed or not. I'd thought it might be difficult physically, but I was certainly fit enough. Now, I wanted to do something that had more of a proper structure to it, I suppose. I get demotivated otherwise. What do you think you learned from your experience? It must have been a great opportunity to examine community life. Yes, but it was difficult at first to be accepted by the locals. It was a very remote village, and some of them were reluctant to speak to me, 
although they were always interested in my clothes and how much I had to pay for them. Well, that's understandable. Yes, but things soon improved. What struck me was that when people became more comfortable with me and less suspicious, we really connected with each other in a meaningful way. You made good friends. Yes, with two of the families in particular. Good. What about management? Did you have a project manager? Yes, and he gave me lots of advice and guidance. And was he good at managing too? That wasn't his strong point. <laughs> <laughs> I think he was often more interested in the academic side of things than filing reports. He was a bit of a dreamer.、Mm. And did you have a contract? I had to stay for a minimum of three months. My parents were surprised when I asked to stay longer. Six months in the end. I was so happy there. And did anything on the administration side of things surprise you? What was the food and lodging like? Simple, but there was plenty to eat, and I only paid seven dollars a day for that, which was amazing, really. And they gave me all the equipment I needed, even a laptop. You didn't expect that, then? No. Well, I look forward to hearing more. But now let's look at these modules. You'll need to start thinking about which ones you'll definitely want to study. The first one here is gender studies in Latin America.、Mm. It looks at how gender analysis is reconfiguring civil society in Latin America. Women are increasingly occupying positions in government and in other elected leadership positions in Latin America. I think you'd find it interesting. If it was to do with people in the villages rather than those in the public sphere, I would. Okay. What about second language acquisition? Do you think I'd find that useful? Well, you've had some practical experience in the field. I think it would be. I hadn't thought about that. I'll put that down as a definite then. Okay. What about indigenous women's lives? That sounds appropriate. I thought so too, but I looked at last year's exam questions, and that changed my mind.、Uh, don't judge the value of the course on that. Maybe talk to some other students first, and we can talk about it again later. Okay. Yes, and lastly, will you sign up for Portuguese lessons? My Spanish is good, so would I find that module easy?、Mm, not necessarily. Some people find that Spanish interferes with learning Portuguese, getting the accent right too. It's quite different in a lot of ways. Well, I'd much sooner do something else then. All right. Now, what we need to do is make a... exercise twelve. Good morning, everyone. In the last few lectures, I've been dealing with business finance, but now I'm going to move on to business systems. And in today's lecture, I'm going to talk about what can go wrong when businesses try to copy their own best practices. Once a business has successfully introduced a new process, managing a branch bank, say, or selling a new product. The parent organization naturally wants to repeat that success and capture it, if possible, on a bigger scale. The goal then is to utilize existing knowledge and not to generate new knowledge. It's a less glamorous activity than pure innovation, but it actually happens more often, as a matter of fact. However, surprisingly. Getting things right the second time is not necessarily any simpler than it was the first time. Now, there's been a lot of research into how companies can repeat their previous successes, and it certainly hasn't been confined to the United States. It seems that most large industries are trying to repeat their own successes and manage the knowledge they've acquired, but even so. It has been shown that the overwhelming majority of attempts fail. A host of studies confirm this, covering a wide range of business settings: branch banks, retail stores, real estate agencies, factories, call centers, to name but a few. So why do so few managers get things right the second or third time? Let's consider one reason for failure. Placing too much trust in the people who are running the successful operation, the experts, shall we say? Managers who want to apply existing knowledge typically start off by going to an expert, such as the person who designed and is running a successful department store, and picking their brains. Now, this approach can be used if you want to gain a rough understanding of a particular system. 
or understand smaller, isolated problems. The trouble is, even the expert doesn't fully grasp the whole thing, because when it comes to complex systems, the individual components of the process are interwoven with one another. The expert never has complete access to the necessary information. And the situation's complicated even further by the fact that experts are usually not aware of their own ignorance. The ignorance can take various forms. For instance, a lot of details of the system are invisible to managers. Some may be difficult to describe, learned on the job, and well-known by workers, perhaps, but impossible to describe in a way that's helpful. And there are some things that people know or do that they're not even aware of. Now, let's consider two types of mistake that can occur when a manager actually starts to set up a duplicate system to replicate a successful process. Firstly, perhaps he forgets that he was just trying to copy another process and starts trying to improve on it. Another mistake is trying to use the best parts of various different systems in the hope of creating the perfect combination. Unfortunately, attempts like these usually turn out to be misguided and lead to problems. Why? Well, for various reasons. Perhaps there weren't really any advantages after all, because the information wasn't accurate. Or perhaps the business settings weren't really comparable. More typically, the advantages are real enough, but there are also disadvantages that have been overlooked. For example, the modifications might compromise safety in some way. So what's the solution? Well, I don't intend to suggest that it's easy to get things right the second time. It's not. But the underlying problem has more to do with attitudes than the actual difficulty of the task, and there are ways of getting it right. These involve adjusting attitudes, first of all. Being more realistic and cautious, really. Secondly, they involve exerting strict controls on the organizational and operational systems. And this, in turn, means copying the original as closely as possible. Not merely duplicating the physical characteristics of the factory, but also duplicating the skills that the original employees had. Reliance on a template like this offers the huge advantage of built-in consistency. Exercise 13 Hello, West Bay Hotel. Can I help you? Oh, good morning. I'm ringing about your advertisement in the Evening Gazette. Is that the one for temporary staff? That's right. Yes, I'm afraid the person who's dealing with that isn't in today, but I can give you the main details if you like. Yes, please. Could you tell me what kind of staff you're looking for? We're looking for waiters at the moment. There was one post for a cook, but that's already been taken. Oh, right. Um, what are the hours of work? There are two different shifts. There is a day shift from 7 to 2, and a late shift from 4 to 11. And can people choose which one they want to do? Not normally, because everyone would choose the day shift, I suppose. You alternate from one week to another. OK, uh, I'm, I'm just writing all this down. What about time off? You get one day off, and I think you can negotiate which one you want. It's more or less up to you, but it has to be the same one every week. Do you know what the rates of pay are? Yes, I've got them here. Uh, you get £5.50 an hour, and that includes a break. Do I have to go home to eat, or...? You don't have to. You can get a meal in the hotel if you want to, and there's no charge for it, so you might as well. Oh, good. Yes, so let's see. I get uh, 221... no, no, 231 pounds a week. You'd also get tips. Our guests tend to be quite generous.
Um, is there a uniform? What about clothes? Yes, I forgot to mention that. You need to wear a white shirt, just a plain one, and dark trousers. You know, not green or anything like that. And we don't supply those. That's OK. I've got trousers. I just have to buy a couple of shirts. What about anything else? Do, do I need a waistcoat or anything? You have to wear a jacket, but the hotel lends you that. I see. Uh, one last thing. I don't know what the starting date is. Mm, just a minute. I think it's sometime around the end of June. Uh, yes, the 28th, in time for the summer. That's great. I'm available from the 10th. Oh, good. Well, if you can call again, you need to speak to the service manager. Her name's Jane Irwin. That's U-R-W-I-N. And she'll probably arrange to meet you. OK. And when's the best time to ring? Could you call tomorrow? Um, she usually starts checking the rooms at midday, so before then if you can, so she'll have more time to chat. I'll just give you her number because she's got a direct line. Thanks. It's 832 009. 823 009. 832. Oh, OK. Yes, I'll do that. And, by the way, she will ask you for a reference, so you might like to be thinking about that. You know, just someone who knows you and can vouch for you. Yes, no problem. Well, thanks very much for your help. You're welcome. Bye. Bye. Exercise 14 Good morning, and welcome again to your city today. With me today is Graham Campbell, a councillor from the City Council. He'll be telling us about the plan to improve the fast-growing suburb of Red Hill. Good morning, Graham, and welcome to the show. Good morning, Carol. Now, Graham, I understand that there has been a lot of community consultation for the new plan. Yes, we've tried to address some of the concerns that local groups told us about. People we've heard from are mainly worried about traffic in the area and, in particular, the increasing speed of cars near schools. They feel that it's only a matter of time before there's an accident as a lot of children walk to the school. So we're trying to do something about that. Another area of concern is the overhead power lines. These are very old and a lot of people we spoke to asked if something could be done about them. Well, I'm happy to report that the power company have agreed to move the power lines underground at a cost of $800,000. I think that will really improve the look of the area as well as being safer. Mm, that's good to know. But will that mean an increase in rates for the local businesses in that area? Well, the power company have agreed to bear the cost of this themselves after a lot of discussion with the council. This is wonderful news, as the council now has some extra funds for us to put into other things like tree planting and artwork. Now, we've also put together a map, which we've sent out to all the residents in the area. And on the map, we've marked the proposed changes. Firstly, we'll plant mature pine trees to provide shelter and shade just to the right of the supermarket in Days Road. In order to address the traffic problems, the pavements on the corner of Carberry and Thomas Street will be widened. This will help to reduce the speed of vehicles entering Thomas Street. We think it's very important to separate the local residential streets from the main road, so... The roadway at the entrance to Thomas Street from Days Road will be painted red. This should mark it more clearly and act as a signal for traffic to slow down. One way of making sure that the pedestrians are safe is to increase signage at the intersections. A keep clear sign will be erected at the junction of Evelyn Street and Hill Street to enable traffic to exit at all times. Something we're planning to do to help control the flow of traffic in the area is to install traffic lights halfway down Hill Street where it crosses Day's Road. Now, we haven't only thought about the cars and traffic, of course. There's also something for the children. We're going to get school children in the area to research a local story, the life of a local sports hero, perhaps. And an artist will incorporate that story into paintings on the wall of a building on the other side of Hill Street from the supermarket. And, finally... We've agreed to build a new children's playground, which will be at the other end of Hill Street, close to the intersection with Carberry Street. Wonderful. Now, what's the next stage? Well, the final plan... Will... Exercise 15. Hi, Jeannie. How's it going? Oh, hello, Dan. Pretty well, thanks. 
Have you managed to get the money for the course yet? Yes, that's all sorted out now, thanks. It took long enough, though. It was practically a year ago that I applied to my local council for a grant, and it took them six months to turn me down. That's really slow. And I thought I was eligible for government funding, but it seems I was mistaken. So then I asked the boss of the company I used to work for if they would sponsor me, and much to my surprise, he said they'd make a contribution. But what about college grants and scholarships? There must be some you could apply for. Yes, there are, but they're all so small that I decided to leave them until I was desperate.、Uh-huh. And in fact, I didn't need to apply. My parents had been saying that as I already had a job, I ought to support myself through college. But in the end, they took pity on me, so now I've just about got enough. That's good. <laughs> so now I can put a bit of effort into meeting people. Haven't had time so far. Any suggestions? What about joining some college clubs? Oh right, you joined several, didn't you? Yes, I'm in the drama club. It's our first performance next week, so we're rehearsing frantically, <laughs> and I've got behind with my work, but it's worth it. I'm hoping to be in the spring production too.、Mm, I've never liked acting. Are you doing anything else? I enjoyed singing when I was at school. So I joined a group when I came to college. I don't think the conductor stretches us enough, though. So I'll give up after the next concert. And I also joined the debating society. It's fun, but with all the rehearsing I'm doing, something has to go. And I'm afraid that's the one. Do you do any sports? Yes, I'm in one of the hockey teams. I'm not very good, but I'd really miss it if I stopped. I decided to try tennis when I came to college. And I'm finding it pretty tough going. I'm simply not fit enough. <laughs> Nor me. I think I'll give that a miss. I'm hoping it'll help me to build up my stamina, but it'll probably be a long haul. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> Thanks. How are you finding the course? I wish we had more seminars. What? I'd have thought we had more than enough already. All those people saying clever things that I could never think of. It's quite interesting, but I wonder if I'm clever enough to be doing this course. I find it helpful to listen to the other people. I like the way we're exploring the subject and working towards getting insight into it. How do you get on with your tutor? I don't think I'm on the same wavelength as mine, so I feel I'm not getting anything out of the tutorials. It would be more productive to read a book instead. Oh, mine's very demanding. She gives me lots of feedback and advice, so I've got much better at writing essays. And she's helping me plan my revision for the end of year exams.、Oh, do tell me, I always struggle with revision. Well, the first thing is to find out exactly what's required in the exams. Hmm. Would it help to get hold of some past papers? Yes, they'll help to make it clear. Right, I'll do that. Then what? Then you can sort out your revision priorities. Based on what's most likely to come up, I put these on a card and read them through regularly. Uh huh. But that isn't enough in itself. You also need a timetable to see how you can fit everything in in the time available. Then keep it in front of you while you're studying. I've done that before, but it hasn't helped me. Maybe you need to do something different every day. So if you break down your revision into small tasks and allocate them to specific days, there's more incentive to tackle them. With big topics, you're more likely to put off starting.、Mm, good idea. And as I revise each topic, I write a single paragraph about it. Then later, I can read it through quickly, and it helps fix things in my mind. Oh, that's brilliant! I also write answers to questions for the exam practice. It's hard to make myself do it though. <laughs> well, I'll try. Thanks a lot, Jeanie. <laughs> that's a great help. No problem. See you around. Bye. Exercise sixteen. Good morning, everyone. I've been invited to talk about my research project into Australian Aboriginal rock paintings. The Australian Aborigines have recorded both real and symbolic images of their time on rock walls for many thousands of years. Throughout the long history of this tradition, new images have appeared and new painting styles have developed, and these characteristics can be used to categorise the different artistic styles. Among these are what we call the dynamic, yam, and modern styles of painting. One of the most significant characteristics of the different styles is the way that humans are depicted in the paintings. 
The more recent paintings show people in static poses, but the first human images to dominate rock art paintings over 8,000 years ago were full of movement. These paintings showed people hunting and cooking food, and so they were given the name dynamic to reflect this energy. It's quite amazing considering they were painted in such a simple stick like form. In the Yam period, there was a movement away from stick figures to a more naturalistic shape. However, they didn't go as far as the modern style, which is known as X ray, because it actually makes a feature of the internal skeleton as well as the organs of animals and humans. The Yam style of painting got its name from the fact that it featured much curvier figures that actually resemble the vegetable called the yam, which is similar to a sweet potato. The modern paintings are interesting because they include paintings at the time of the first contact with European settlers. Aborigines managed to convey the idea of the settlers' clothing by simply painting the Europeans without any hands, indicating the habit of standing with their hands in their pockets. Size is another characteristic. The more recent images tend to be life size or even larger, but the dynamic figures are painted in miniature. Aboriginal rock art also records the environmental changes that occurred over thousands of years. For example, we know from the dynamic paintings that over 8,000 years ago, Aborigines would have rarely eaten fish and sea levels were much lower at this time. In fact, Fish didn't start to appear in paintings until the Yam period, along with shells and other marine images. The paintings of the Yam tradition also suggest that, during this time, the Aborigines moved away from animals as their main food source and began including vegetables in their diet, as these feature prominently. Freshwater creatures didn't appear in the paintings until the modern period from 4,000 years ago. So these paintings have already taught us a lot. But one image that has always intrigued us is known as the Rainbow Serpent. The Rainbow Serpent, which is the focus of my most recent project, gets its name from its snake or serpent like body, and it first appeared in the Yam period four to six thousand years ago. Many believe it is a curious mixture of kangaroo, snake, and crocodile. But we decided to study the rainbow serpent paintings to see if we could locate the animal that the very first painters based their image on. The Yam period coincided with the end of the last ice age. This brought about tremendous change in the environment, with the sea levels rising and creeping steadily inland. This flooded many familiar land features and also caused a great deal of disruption to traditional patterns of life, hunting in particular. New shores were formed and totally different creatures would have washed up onto the shores. We studied 107 paintings of the rainbow serpent and found that the one creature that matches it most closely was the ribboned pipefish, which is a type of seahorse. This sea creature would have been a totally unfamiliar sight in the inland regions where the image is found, and it may have been the inspiration behind the early paintings. So... At the end of the Ice Age, there would have been enormous changes in animal and plant life. It's not surprising, then, that the Aborigines linked this abundance to the new creatures they witnessed. Even today, Aborigines see the rainbow serpent as a symbol of creation, which is understandable given the increase in vegetation and the new life forms that featured when the image first appeared. Exercise 17 Hello. Tourist Information Centre, Mike speaking, how can I help you? Oh, hi. I wanted to find out about cookery classes. I believe there are some one-day classes for tourists? Well, they're open to everyone, but tourists are always welcome. OK, let me give you some details of what's available. There are several classes. One very popular one is at the food studio. OK. They focus on seasonal products. And as well as teaching you how to cook them, they also show you how to choose them. Right, that sounds good. How big are the classes? I'm not sure exactly, but they'll be quite small. And could I get a private lesson there? I think so. Let me check. Yes, they do offer those. Though, in fact, most of the people who attend the classes find it's a nice way of getting to know one another. I suppose it must be, yes. And this company has a special deal for clients 
where they offer a discount of 20% if you return for a further class. OK, but you said there were several classes. That's right. Another one you might be interested in is Bond's Cookery School. They're quite new. They just opened six months ago, but I've heard good things about them. They concentrate on teaching you to prepare healthy food, and they have quite a lot of specialist staff. So is that food for people on a diet and things like that? I don't know if I'd be interested in that. Well, I don't think they particularly focus on low-calorie diets or weight loss. It's more to do with recipes that look at specific needs, like including ingredients that will help build up your bones and make them stronger, that sort of thing. I see. Well, I might be interested. I'm not sure. Do they have a website I could check? Yes. Just key in the name of the school. It'll come up. And if you want to know more about them, every Thursday evening they have a lecture at the school. It's free, and you don't need to book or anything. Just turn up at 7.30. And that might give you an idea of whether you want to go to an actual class. OK, there's one more place you might be interested in. That's got a rather strange name. It's called the Aretza Centre. That's spelled A-R-R-E-T-S-A. -R -R -E OK. They've got a very good reputation. They do a bit of meat and fish cookery, but they mostly specialise in vegetarian dishes. Right. That's certainly an area I'd like to learn more about. I've got lots of friends who don't eat meat. In fact, I think I might have seen that school today. Is it just by the market? That's right. So they don't have any problem getting their ingredients. They're right next door. And they also offer a special two-hour course in how to use a knife. They cover all the different skills, buying them, sharpening, chopping techniques. It gets booked up quickly, though, so you'd need to check it was available. Right. Well, thank you very much. I'll go and check that out. Exercise 18 Good evening, everyone. My name's Phil Sutton, and I'm chairman of the Highways Committee. We've called this meeting to inform members of the public about the new regulations for traffic and parking we're proposing for Granford. I'll start by summarising these changes before we open the meeting to questions. So, why do we need to make these changes to traffic systems in Granford? Well, we're very aware that traffic is becoming an increasing problem. It's been especially noticeable with the increase in heavy traffic while they've been building the new hospital. But it's the overall rise in the volume of traffic of all kinds that's concerning us. To date, there's not been any increase in traffic accidents, but that's not something we want to see happen, obviously. We recently carried out a survey of local residents, and their responses were interesting. People were very concerned about the lack of visibility on some roads due to cars parked along the sides of the roads. We'd expected complaints about the congestion near the school when parents are dropping off their children or picking them up. But this was on top of the list, and nor were noise and fumes from trucks and lorries, though they were mentioned by some people. We think these new traffic regulations would make a lot of difference, but we still have a long way to go. We've managed to keep our proposals within budget, just, so they can be covered by the Council. But, of course, it's no good introducing new regulations if we don't have a way of making sure that everyone obeys them. And that's an area we're still working on with the help of representatives from the police force. OK, so this slide shows a map of the central area of Granford with the High Street in the middle and School Road on the right. Now, we already have a set of traffic lights in the High Street at the junction with Station Road, but we're planning to have another set at the other end, at the School Road junction, to regulate the flow of traffic along the High Street. We've decided we definitely need a pedestrian crossing. We considered putting this on School Road, just outside the school, but in the end we decided that could lead to a lot of traffic congestion. So we decided to locate it on the High Street, crossing the road in front of the supermarket. 
That's a very busy area, so it should help things there. We are proposing some changes to parking. At present, parking isn't allowed on the high street outside the library, but we are going to change that and allow parking there, but not at the other end of the high street near School Road. There'll be a new no parking sign on School Road, just by the entrance to the school, forbidding parking for 25 metres. This should improve visibility for drivers and pedestrians, especially on the bend just to the north of the school. As far as disabled drivers are concerned, at present they have parking outside the supermarket, but lorries also use those spaces, so we've got two new disabled parking spaces on the side road up towards the bank. It's not ideal, but probably better than the present arrangement. We also plan to widen the pavement on School Road. We think we can manage to get an extra half metre on the bend just before you get to the school, on the same side of the road. Finally, we've introduced new restrictions on loading and unloading for the supermarket, so lorries will only be allowed to stop there before 8am. That's the supermarket on School Road. We kept to the existing arrangements with the High Street supermarket. OK, so that's about it. Now, what... Exercise 19 We've got to choose a topic for our experiment, haven't we, Jack? Were you thinking of something to do with seeds? Hmm, that's right. I thought we could look at seed germination, how a seed begins to grow. OK. Any particular reason? I know you're hoping to work in plant science eventually. Yeah, but practically everything we do is going to feed into that. No, there's an optional module on seed structure and function in the third year that I might do. So I thought it might be useful for that. If I choose that option, I don't have to do a dissertation module. Good idea. Hmm, well, I thought for this experiment, we could look at the relationship between seed size and the way the seeds are planted. So we could plant different sized seeds in different ways and see which grow best. OK. We'd need to allow time for the seeds to come up. That should be fine if we start now. A lot of the other possible experiments need quite a bit longer. So that'd make it a good one to choose. And I don't suppose it'd need much equipment. We're not doing chemical analysis or anything. Though that's not really an issue. We've got plenty of equipment in the laboratory. Yeah, we need to have a word with the tutor if we're going to go ahead with it, though. I'm sure our aim's OK. It's not very ambitious, but the assignment's only 10% of our final mark, isn't it? But we need to be sure we're the only ones doing it. Yeah, it's only 5%, actually. But it'd be a bit boring if everyone was doing it. Did you read that book on seed germination on our reading list? The one by Graves? Hmm. I looked through it for my last experiment, though it wasn't all that relevant there. It would be for this experiment, though. I found it quite hard to follow... Lots about the theory, which I hadn't expected. Yes, I'd been hoping for something more practical. It does include references to the recent findings on genetically modified seeds, though. Yes, that was interesting. I read an article about seed germination by Lee Hall. About seeds that lie in the ground for ages and only germinate after a fire. Hmm, that's the one. I knew a bit about it already, but not about this research. His analysis of figures comparing the times of the fires and the proportion of seeds that germinated was done in a lot of detail. Very impressive. Was that the article with the illustrations of early stages of plant development? They were very clear. I think those diagrams were in another article. Anyway, shall we have a look at the procedure for our experiment? We'll need to get going with it quite soon. Right. So the first thing we have to do is find our seeds. I think vegetable seeds would be best. 
And obviously they mustn't all be the same size. So how many sorts do we need? About four different ones? I think that would be enough. There'll be quite a large number of seeds for each one. Then for each seed, we need to find out how much it weighs and also measure its dimensions. And we need to keep a careful record of all that. That'll be quite time consuming. And we also need to decide how deep we're going to plant the seeds, right on the surface a few millimetres down or several centimetres. OK, so then we get planting. Do you think we can plant several seeds together in the same plant pot? No, I think we need a different one for each seed. Hmm, right. And we'll need to label them. We can use different coloured labels. Then we wait for the seeds to germinate. I reckon that'll be about three weeks, depending on what the weather's like. Then we see if our plants have come up and write down how tall they've grown. Then all we have to do is look at our numbers and see if there's any relation between them. That's right. So then we get... Exercise 20 Hi. Today we're going to be looking at animals in urban environments. And I'm going to be telling you about some research on how they're affected by these environments. Now, in evolutionary terms, Urban environments represent huge upheavals, the sorts of massive changes that usually happen over millions of years. And we used to think that only a few species could adapt to this new environment. One species which is well known as being highly adaptable is the crow, and there have been various studies about how they manage to learn new skills. Another successful species is the pigeon, because they're able to perch on ledges on the walls of city buildings, just like they once perched on cliffs by the sea. But, in fact, we're now finding that these early immigrants were just the start of a more general movement of animals into cities, and of adaptation by these animals to city life. And one thing that researchers are finding especially interesting is the speed with which they're doing this. We're not talking about gradual evolution here. These animals are changing fast. Let me tell you about some of the studies that have been carried out in this area. So, in the University of Minnesota, a biologist called Emily Snellrud and her colleagues looked at specimens of urbanized small mammals such as mice and gophers that had been collected in Minnesota and that are now kept in museums there. And she looked at specimens that had been collected over the last hundred years, which is a very short time in evolutionary terms. And she found that during that time, these small mammals had experienced a jump in brain size when compared to rural mammals. Now, we can't be sure this means they're more intelligent, but since the sizes of other parts of the body didn't change, it does suggest that something cognitive was going on. And Snellrude thinks that this change might reflect the cognitive demands of adjusting to city life, having to look in different places to find food, for example, and coping with a whole new set of dangers. Then over in Germany, at the Max Planck Institute, there's another biologist called Katerina Miranda, who's done some experiments with blackbirds living in urban and rural areas. And she's been looking not at their anatomy, but at their behavior. So, as you might expect, she's found that the urban blackbirds tend to be quite bold. They're prepared to face up to a lot of threats that would frighten away their country counterparts. But there's one type of situation that does seem to frighten the urban blackbirds, and that's anything new, anything they haven't experienced before. And if you think about it, that's quite sensible for a bird living in the city. Jonathan Atwell, in Indiana University, is looking at how a range of animals respond to urban environments. He's found that when they're under stress, their endocrine systems react by reducing the amount of hormones, such as corticosterone, into their blood. 
it's a sensible-seeming adaptation. A rat that gets scared every time a subway train rolls past won't be very successful. There's just one more study I'd like to mention, which is by Sarah Parton and her team. And they've been looking at how squirrels communicate in an urban environment, and they've found that a routine part of their communication is carried out by waving their tails. You do also see this in the country, but it's much more prevalent in cities, possibly because it's effective in a noisy environment. So what are the long-term implications of this? One possibility is that we may see completely new species developing in cities. But on the other hand, it's possible that not all of these adaptations will be permanent. Once the animals got accustomed to its new environment, it may no longer need the features it's developed. So now we've had a look at adaptation. Exercise 21 Hello, South City Cycling Club. Oh, hi. Um, I want to find out about joining the club. Right, I can help you there. I'm the club secretary and my name's Jim Hunter. Oh, hi, Jim. So, are you interested in membership for yourself? That's right. OK, well, there are basically two types of adult membership. If you're pretty serious about cycling, there's the full membership. That costs $260, and that covers you not just for ordinary cycling, but also for races, both here in the city and also in other parts of Australia. Right. Well, I'm not really up to that standard. I was more interested in just joining a group to do some cycling in my free time. Sure. That's why most people join. So, in that case, you'd be better with the recreational membership. That's $108 if you're over 19 and $95 if you're under. I'm 25. OK. It's paid quarterly and you can upgrade it later to the full membership if you want to, of course. Now, both types of membership include the club fee of $20. They also provide insurance in case you have an accident, though we hope you won't need that, of course. No. OK. Well, I'll go with the recreational membership, I think, and that allows me to join in the club activities and so on? That's right. And once you're a member of the club, you're also permitted to wear our kit when you're out cycling. It's green and white. Yes, I've seen cyclists wearing it. So can I buy that at the club? Uh, no, it's made to order by a company in Brisbane. You can find them online. They're called Jerry's. That's J-E-R-R-I-Z. You can use your membership number to put in an order on their website. OK. Now, can you tell me a bit about the rides I can do? Sure. So we have training rides pretty well every morning and they're a really good way of improving your cycling skills as well as your general level of fitness. But they're different levels. Level A is pretty fast. You're looking at about 30 or 35 kilometres an hour. If you can do about 25 kilometres an hour, you'd probably be level B and then level C are the novices who stay at about 15 kilometres per hour. Right. Well, I reckon I'd be level B. So when are the sessions for that level? Uh, there are a couple each week. They're both early morning sessions. There's one on Tuesdays. And for that one, you meet at 5.30am. And the meeting point's the stadium. Do you know where that is? Yes, it's quite near my home, in fact. OK, and how about the other one? That's on Thursdays. It starts at the same time, but they meet at the main gate to the park. Is that the one just past the shopping mall? That's it. So how long are the rides? Uh, they're about an hour and a half, so if you have a job, it's easy to fit in before you go to work. And the members often go somewhere for coffee afterwards, so it's quite a social event. 
Okay, that sounds good. I've only just moved to the city, so I don't actually know many people yet. Well, it's a great way to meet people. And does each ride have a leader? Sometimes, but not always. But you don't really need one. The group members on the ride support one another anyway. How would we know where to go? If you check the club website, you'll see that the route for each ride is clearly marked. So you can just print that out and take it along with you. It's similar from one week to another, but it's not always exactly the same. And what do I need to bring? Hmm, well, bring a bottle of water and your phone. You shouldn't use it while you're cycling, but have it with you. Right. And in winter, it's well before sunrise when we set out, so you need to make sure your bike's got lights. That's OK. Well, thanks, Jim. I'd definitely like to join. So what's the best way of going about it? Ah, uh, you can... Exercise 22. Thanks for coming, everyone. OK, so this meeting is for new staff and staff who haven't been involved with our volunteering projects yet. So basically, the idea is that we allow staff to give up some of their work time to help on various charity projects to benefit the local community. We've been doing this for the last five years, and it's been very successful. Participating doesn't necessarily involve a huge time commitment. The company will pay for eight hours of your time. That can be used over one or two days all at once or spread over several months throughout the year. There are some staff who enjoy volunteering so much, they also give up their own free time for a couple of hours every week. It's completely up to you. Obviously, many people will have family commitments and aren't as available as other members of staff. Feedback from staff has been overwhelmingly positive. Because they felt they were doing something really useful, nearly everyone agreed that volunteering made them feel more motivated at work. They also liked building relationships with the people in the local community and felt valued by them. One or two people also said it was a good thing to have on their CVs. One particularly successful project last year was the Get Working Project. This was aimed at helping unemployed people in the area get back to work. Our staff were able to help them improve their telephone skills, such as writing down messages and speaking with confidence to potential customers, which they had found quite difficult. This is something many employers look for in job applicants, and something we all do without even thinking about every day at work. We've got an exciting new project starting this year. Up until now, we've mainly focused on projects to do with education and training. And we'll continue with our reading project in schools and our work with local charities. But we've also agreed to help out on a conservation project in Redfern Park. So if any of you fancy being outside and getting your hands dirty, this is the project for you. I also wanted to mention the annual Digital Inclusion Day, which is coming up next month. The aim of this is to help older people keep up with technology. And this year, instead of hosting the event in our own training facility, we're using the ICT suite at Hill College, as it can hold far more people. We've invited over 60 people from the Silver Age Community Center to take part, so we'll need a lot of volunteers to help with this event. If you're interested in taking part, please go to the volunteering section of our website and complete the relevant form. We won't be providing any training for this, but you'll be paired with an experienced volunteer if you've never done it before. By the way, don't forget to tell your manager about any volunteering activities you decide to do. The participants on the Digital Inclusion Day really benefited. The majority were in their 70s, though some were younger, and a few were even in their 90s. Quite a few owned both a computer and a mobile phone, but these tended to be outdated models. They generally knew how to do simple things, like send texts, but weren't aware of recent developments in mobile phone technology. 
A few were keen to learn, but most were quite dismissive at first. They couldn't see the point of updating their skills. But that soon changed. The feedback was very positive. The really encouraging thing was that participants all said they felt much more confident about using social media to keep in touch with their grandchildren, who prefer this form of communication to phoning or sending emails. A lot of them also said playing online games would help them make new friends and keep their brains active. They weren't that impressed with being able to order their groceries online, as they liked going out to the shops, but some said it would come in handy if they were ill or the weather was really bad. One thing they asked about was using tablets for things like reading newspapers. Some people had been given tablets as presents, but had never used them. So that's something we'll make sure we include this time. Exercise 23 Ah, uh, come in, Russ. Thank you. Now, you wanted to consult me about your class presentation on nanotechnology. You're due to give it next week, aren't you? That's right, and I'm really struggling. I chose the topic because I didn't know much about it and wanted to learn more. But now I've read so much about it, in a way there's too much to say. I could talk for much longer than the 20 minutes I've been allocated. Should I assume the other students don't know much and give them a kind of general introduction? Or should I try and make them share my fascination with a particular aspect? You could do either, but you'll need to have it clear in your own mind. Then I think I'll give an overview. OK. Now, one way of approaching this is to work through developments in chronological order. Uh-huh. On the other hand, you could talk about the numerous ways that nanotechnology is being applied. You mean things like thin films on camera displays to make them water repellent and additives to make motorcycle helmets stronger and lighter? Exactly. Or another way would be to focus on its impact in one particular area, say medicine or space exploration. That would make it easier to focus. Perhaps I should do that. I think that would be a good idea. Right. How important is it to include slides in the presentation? They aren't essential by any means. And there's a danger of tailoring what you say to fit whatever slides you can find. While it can be good to include slides, you could end up spending too long looking for suitable ones. You might find it better to leave them out. I see. Another thing I was wondering about was how to start. I know presentations often begin with, first I'm going to talk about this, and then I'll talk about that. But I thought about asking the audience what they know about nanotechnology. That would be fine if you had an hour or two for the presentation, but you might find that you can't do anything with the answers you get, and it simply eats into the short time that's available. So maybe I should mention a particular way that nanotechnology is used to focus people's attention. That sounds sensible. What do you think I should do next? I really have to plan the presentation today and tomorrow. Well, initially, I think you should ignore all the notes you've made, take a small piece of paper and write a single short sentence that ties together the whole presentation. It can be something as simple as, nanotechnology is already improving our lives. Then start planning the content around that. You can always modify that sentence later if you need to. OK. OK, now let's think about actually giving the presentation. You've only given one before, if I remember correctly, about an experiment you'd been involved in. That's right. It was pretty rubbish. Let's say it was better in some respects than in others. With regard to the structure, I felt that you ended rather abruptly, without rounding it off. Be careful not to do that in next week's presentation. OK. And you made very little eye contact with the audience because you were looking down at your notes most of the time. You need to be looking at the audience and only occasionally glancing at your notes. Mm. Your body language was a little odd. Every time you showed a slide, you turned your back on the audience so you could look at it. You should have been looking at your laptop. And you kept scratching your head, so I found myself wondering when you were next going to do that, instead of listening to what you were saying. Oh dear. 
What did you think of the language? I knew that not everyone was familiar with the subject, so I tried to make it as simple as I could. Yes, that came across. You used a few words that are specific to the field, but you always explained what they meant, so the audience wouldn't have had any difficulty understanding. Uh huh. I must say the handouts you prepared were well thought out. They were a good summary of your presentation, which people would have been able to refer to later on. So well done on that. Thank you. Well, I hope that helps you with next week's presentation. Yes, it will. Thanks a lot. I'll look forward to seeing a big improvement then. Exercise twenty-four. Hello, Linda speaking. Oh, hi, Linda. This is Matt Brooks. Alex White gave me your number. He said you'd be able to give me some advice about moving to Banford. Yes, Alex did mention you. How can I help? Well, first of all, which area to live in? Well, I live in Dalton, which is a really nice suburb, not too expensive, and there's a nice park. Sounds good. Do you know how much it would be to rent a two-bedroom flat there? Yeah, you should be able to get something reasonable for eight hundred and fifty pounds per month. That's what people typically pay. You certainly wouldn't want to pay more than nine hundred pounds. That doesn't include bills or anything. No, that sounds all right. I'll definitely have a look there. Are the transport links easy from where you live? Well, I'm very lucky. I work in the city centre, so I don't have to use public transport. I go by bike. Oh, I wish I could do that. Is it safe to cycle around the city? Yes, it's fine, and it keeps me fit. Anyway, driving to work in the city centre would be a nightmare. Because there's hardly any parking, and the traffic during the rush hour can be bad. I'd be working from home, but I'd have to go to London one or two days a week. Oh, that's perfect. Getting to London is no problem. There's a fast train every thirty minutes, which only takes forty-five minutes. That's good. Yeah. The train service isn't bad during the week, and they run quite late at night. It's weekends that are a problem. They're always doing engineering work, and you have to take a bus to Haddam and pick up the train there, which is really slow. But other than that, Banford's a great place to live. I've never been happier. There are some nice restaurants in the city centre, and a brand new cinema, which has only been open a couple of months. There's a good art centre too. Sounds like Banford's got it all. Yes, we're really lucky. There are lots of really good aspects to living here. The schools are good. And the hospital here is one of the best in the country. Everyone I know who's been there's had a positive experience. Oh, I can give you the name of my dentist too in Bridge Street, if you're interested. I've been going to him for years, and I've never had any problems. Oh, okay, thanks. I'll find his number and send it to you. Thanks. That would be really helpful. Are you planning to visit Banford soon? Yes, my wife and I are both coming next week. We want to make some appointments with estate agents. I could meet you if you like and show you around. Are you sure? We'd really appreciate that. Either Tuesday or Thursday is good for me. After five thirty. Thursday is preferable. Tuesday, I need to get home before six p.m.
Okay. Great. Let me know which train you're catching, and I'll meet you in the cafe outside. You can't miss it. It's opposite the station and next to the museum. Brilliant. I'll text you next week then. Thanks so much for all the advice. No problem. I'll see you next week. Exercise 25. So, if you're one of those people who hasn't found the perfect physical activity yet, here are some things to think about which might help you make the right decision for you. The first question to ask yourself is whether you would enjoy training in a gym. Many people are put off by the idea of having to fit a visit to the gym into their busy day. You often have to go very early or late, as some gyms can get very crowded. But with regular training, you'll see a big difference in a relatively short space of time. Running has become incredibly popular in recent years. That's probably got a lot to do with the fact that it's a very accessible form of exercise. Anyone can run, even if you can only run a few metres to begin with. But make sure you get the right shoes. It's worth investing in a high quality pair, and they don't come cheap. Another great thing about running is that you can do it at any time of day or night. The only thing that may stop you is snow and ice. Swimming is another really good way to build fitness. What attracts many people is that you can swim in an indoor pool at any time of year. On the other hand, it can be quite boring or solitary. It's hard to chat to people while you're swimming lengths. Cycling has become almost as popular as running in recent years. That's probably because, as well as improving their fitness, many people say being out in the fresh air in a park or in the countryside can be fun, provided the conditions are right, of course. Only fanatics go out in the wind and rain. Yoga is a good choice for those of you looking for exercise which focuses on developing both a healthy mind and body. It's a good way of building strength, and with the right instructor, there's less chance of hurting yourself than with other more active sports. But don't expect to find it easy. It can be surprisingly challenging, especially for people who aren't very flexible. Getting a personal trainer is a good way to start your fitness program. Obviously, there can be significant costs involved, but if you've got someone there to encourage you and help you achieve your goals, you're less likely to give up. Make sure you get someone with a recognised qualification, though, or you could do yourself permanent damage. Whatever you do, don't join a gym unless you're sure you'll make good use of it. So many people waste lots of money by signing up for membership and then hardly ever go. What happens to their good intentions? I don't think people suddenly stop caring about improving their fitness or decide they have more important things to do. I think people lose interest when they don't think they're making enough progress. That's when they give up hope and stop believing they'll ever achieve their goals. Also, what people sometimes don't realise when they start is that it takes a lot of determination and hard work to keep training week after week, and lots of people don't have that kind of commitment. One thing you can do to help yourself is to set manageable goals. Be realistic and don't push yourself too far. Some people advise writing goals down, but I think it's better to have a flexible approach. Give yourself a really nice treat every time you reach one of your goals. And don't get too upset if you experience setbacks. It's a journey. There are bound to be difficulties along the way. Exercise 26 OK, Jim. You wanted to see me about your textile design project. That's right. I've been looking at how a range of natural dyes can be used to colour fabrics like cotton and wool. 
Why did you choose that topic? Well, I got a lot of useful ideas from the museum, you know, at that exhibition of textiles. But I've always been interested in anything to do with colour. Years ago, I went to a carpet shop with my parents when we were on holiday in Turkey, and I remember all the amazing colours. They might not all have been natural dyes. Maybe not. But for the project, I decided to follow it up. And I found a great book about a botanic garden in California that specialises in plants used for dyes. OK. So in your project, you had to include a practical investigation. Yeah. At first, I couldn't decide on my variables. I was going to just look at one type of fibre, for example, like cotton. And see how different types of dyes affected it? Yes. Then I decided to include others as well. So I looked at cotton and wool and nylon. With just one type of dye? Various types, including some that weren't natural, for comparison. OK. So I did the experiments last week. I used some ready-made natural dyes. I found a website which supplied them. They came in just a few days, but I also made some of my own. That must have taken quite a bit of time. Yes, I thought it'd just be a matter of a teaspoon or so of dye, and actually that wasn't the case at all. Like, I was using one vegetable, a beetroot, for a red dye, and I had to chop up a whole pile of it. So it all took longer than I'd expected. One possibility is to use food colourings. I did use one. That was a yellow dye, an artificial one. Tatrazine? Yeah. I used it on cotton first. It came out a great colour. But when I rinsed the material, the colour just washed away. I'd been going to try it out on nylon, but I abandoned that idea. Were you worried about health issues? I thought if it's a legal food colouring, it must be safe. Well, it can occasionally cause allergic reactions, I believe. So what natural dyes did you look at? Well, one was turmeric. The colour's great. It's a really strong yellow. It's generally used in dishes like curry. It's meant to be quite good for your health when eaten, but you might find it's not permanent when it's used as a dye. A few washes and it's gone. Right. I used beetroot as a dye for wool. When I chop up beetroot to eat, I always end up with bright red hands. But the wool ended up just a sort of watery cream shade. Disappointing. There's a natural dye called Tyrian purple. Have you heard of that? Yes. It comes from a shellfish, and it was worn in ancient times, but only by important people, as it was so rare. I didn't use it. It fell out of use centuries ago, though one researcher managed to get hold of some recently. But that shade of purple can be produced by chemical dyes nowadays. Did you use any black dyes? Logwood. That was quite complicated. I had to prepare the fabric so the dye would take. I hope you were careful to wear gloves. Yes, I know the danger with that dye. Good, it can be extremely dangerous if it's ingested. Now, presumably you had a look at an insect-based dye, like cochineal, for example. Yes, I didn't actually make that. I didn't have time to start crushing up insects to get the red colour. And anyway, they're not available here. But I managed to get the dye quite easily from a website... But it cost a fortune. I can see why it's generally just used in cooking and in small quantities. Yes, it's very effective, but that's precisely why it's not used as a dye. I also read about using metal oxide. Apparently, you can allow iron to rust while it's in contact with the fabric, and that colours it. Yes, that works well for dyeing cotton. But you have to be careful as the metal can actually affect the fabric, and so you can't expect to get a lot of wear out of fabrics treated in this way. And the colours are quite subtle. Not everyone likes them. Anyway, it looks as if you've done a lot of work. Exercise 27 Last week we started looking at reptiles, including crocodiles and snakes. Today, I'd like us to have a look at another reptile, the lizard, and in particular, at some studies that have been done on a particular type of lizard whose Latin name is Teliqua rugosa. This is commonly known as the sleepy lizard because it's quite slow in its movements and spends quite a lot of its time dozing under rocks or lying in the sun. I'll start with a general description. Sleepy lizards live in Western and South Australia, where they're quite common. Unlike European lizards, which are mostly small, green and fast-moving, sleepy lizards are brown 
but what's particularly distinctive about them is the colour of their tongue, which is dark blue, in contrast with the lining of their mouth, which is bright pink. And they're much bigger than most European lizards. They have quite a varied diet, including insects and even small animals, but they mostly eat plants of varying kinds. Even though they're quite large and powerful, with strong jaws that can crush beetles and snail shells, they still have quite a few predators. Large birds like cassowaries were one of the main ones in the past, but nowadays they're more likely to be caught and killed by snakes. Actually, another threat to their survival isn't a predator at all, but is man-made. Quite a large number of sleepy lizards are killed by cars when they're trying to cross highways. One study carried out by Michael Freak at Flinders University investigated the methods of navigation of these lizards. Though they move slowly, they can travel quite long distances. And he found that even if they were taken some distance away from their home territory, they could usually find their way back home as long as they could see the sky. They didn't need any other landmarks on the ground. Observations of these lizards in the wild have also revealed that their mating habits are quite unusual. Unlike most animals, it seems that they're relatively monogamous, returning to the same partner year after year. And the male and female also stay together for a long time, both before and after the birth of their young. It's quite interesting to think about the possible reasons for this. It could be that it's to do with protecting their young. You'd expect them to have a much better chance of survival if they have both parents around. But in fact, observers have noted that once the babies have hatched out of their eggs, they have hardly any contact with their parents. So there's not really any evidence to support that idea. Another suggestion is based on the observation that male lizards in monogamous relationships tend to be bigger and stronger than other males. So maybe the male lizards stay around so they can give the female lizards protection from other males. But again, we're not really sure. Finally, I'd like to mention another study that involved collecting data by tracking the lizards. I was actually involved in this myself. So we caught some lizards in the wild and we developed a tiny GPS system that would allow us to track them and we fixed this onto their tails. Then we set the lizards free again and we were able to track them for 12 days and gather data, not just about their location, but even about how many steps they took during this period. One surprising thing we discovered from this is that there were far fewer meetings between lizards than we expected. It seems that they were actually trying to avoid one another. So why would that be? Well, again, we have no clear evidence, but one hypothesis is that male lizards can cause quite serious injuries to one another. So maybe this avoidance is a way of preventing this, of self-preservation, if you like. But we need to collect a lot more data before we can be sure of any of this. Hello, how can I help you? Um, hello. Is it possible to book a bus tour of the city here? Of course, sir. When would you like to take the tour? There are tours in the morning, afternoon and evening. Sometimes it's nice to see the city at night with the buildings lit up. We'll be going out for dinner tonight, so we'd prefer to go this afternoon. Oh, and it's for two people. Right. Now, I just need some details. Can you give me the names of the two people, please? Yes. Susan Field and James Carter. Susan Field and James... Sorry, can you spell your surname for me, please? It's Carter. C-A-R-T-E-R. -E Thank you. And can I have a contact telephone number? Why do you need one? Just in case we have to cancel the tour and need to contact you. I see. Well, my mobile number is 07988 -636 that's 07988 636197. Now, can you also tell me which hotel you're staying at? The Crest Hotel. Oh, uh, no, sorry. That's the hotel we're staying in next week. It's the Riverside Hotel. 
Oh, the Riverside is a lovely hotel. Are you enjoying your stay? Yes, we are, very much. We definitely recommend it to others. Oh, I am glad. Now, I can book you on the tour at 4pm. Would that suit you? Alternatively, there is one at 2. Two would be better for us, please. Right. That's booked for you, sir. Two people at 2pm today, August the 14th. You pay the bus driver when you get on and it's £4 per person. Thank you very much.